There we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our ASA Stance Club general meeting. Uh, my name is Mufaro. I'm the president, and the recording has started. I'll hand it off to Andrea, the vice president, to uh, do the appropriate um, introductions, and we'll get along with our meeting. Feel free to use the, ch the chat if you have any questions or if you need anything. Okay. So this week's guest speaker, her name is Graciela Contreras. She is the branch chief of performance analysis external reporting branch in the Office of Performance and Quality in U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. So today we're taking a bit of a different path, seeing how statistics and data science can be used for the U.S. government work rather um, than what we normally do. So whenever you're ready, I'm going to let you take it away, Grace. Sure thing. Great. Thank you. Um, before I get started, uh, I would just like to say, yeah, as Andrew mentioned, my name is Graciela Contreras. Uh, I, I go by Gracie. And I want to thank you. Well, thank you, Andrea, for setting this up. Uh, thanks for inviting me for speaking with you all tonight. I, um, I made a sort of informal little presentation for y'all. Hopefully, it'll, you know, share some insight on the type of work that I do with the federal government. And towards the end, I am kind of curious as, as to hear about what other sort of speakers you had. But let me see if I can navigate this. Uh, oh man, well, hopefully I can, because I don't really do a lot of Zoom here. I'll Zoom to share your screen. Okay. But, oh, sweet. Are you able, oh, can somebody just let me know? Are you Wait. able to see my screen or no? Oh, Not. No? Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry about that. Let's see. Maybe. Oh, man. Um, do you see the share screen button at the bottom, the green one? Yeah, I did press that, but then. All right. Sorry about that. Let's see. Let's see, portion of the screen. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I have like these system preferences and privacy. Oh no, sorry. Yes, allow. Yes, allow them. Yes, yes, yes. Oh no. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, this is not. No worries. While you do that, I can make some announcements. Sure. Okay, so uh, tomorrow is Best Fast, as y'all know. Y'all can come out, support the club. I'm sure um, Anderson has told you all about the incentives. Just you come buy some popcorn from us. We have some cool flavors. We got Cinnamon Toast Crunch. We have um, Twix. And then, of course, Cheddar and Kettle Corn. <gasps> okay, it's ready. Okay, great. There we go. All right, awesome. There we go. So, yes, as I mentioned, I made it really informal. Um, cause I, is it safe to assume that are y'all are undergrad and graduate students or? Mostly undergrad. Undergrad. Okay, great. All right. Great. Perfect. Uh, I remember those days. Well, anyway, so as I mentioned, um, I, I'm, my name is Gracie Contreras and here's my sort of informal agenda. I like to give a bit of an introduction about myself and where I'm from and sort of, you know, just a general background. Uh, my career pathway, day-to-day uh, -day work. And the other thing too, since I'm a federal government employee, I wanted to give, uh, you know, shed some light on pros and cons of being a Fed or well, that's what we, working in the federal government, it's all about acronyms and <laughs> shortening words. And it's just like, hey, you know what I mean, right? And, and then some advice, you know, um, from, you know, from being an undergrad or even a graduate student going out into, I want to say the real world because yeah, we're all experiencing the real world right now, but just, you know, in general, like going out and getting your first job and the day-to-day -day, nine to five, you know, all that jazz. And you'll have to excuse me. I have my, my daughter with me and she's been my coworker, I would say for the past year and a half or being close to two years since we, since uh, the COVID shut down. All right, so here we go. So my, uh, I was born and raised in Eagle Pass, Texas, which is a border town, uh, let's say like two and a half hours south of San Antonio. 
And oh, other? I'm from Eagle Pass too. Oh, nice. Very cool. Wait, who said that? I'm sorry. That... Um, me. <laughs> what is it? Oh, like, sorry. Nice, nice to meet you, Rachel. So, I'm sorry, you'll have to excuse me too, because I'm trying to... I need to keep the Muppet Babies on rotation for her. <laughs> she, she'll lose it. All right, let me... And so the thing is, I was, so as I mentioned, I'm also the, well, you'll have to excuse me too, but I'm also the daughter of immigrants from Mexico. My, my father and my brother were both from Mexico and they only had a grade school education. So I was one of the first in my family to go to college, um, to be a, it's okay. here, here, here. sorry about that. And I'm also a first generation professional. Because, you know, my parents held blue collar jobs and and we were also growing up. We we're also migrant farm workers. So I have been in touch, you know, being a, a child and I was speaking English. I did a lot for my parents because they only spoke Spanish. So I, I filled out a lot of forms. I helped them translate. And the reason I'm saying a lot about this is because it ties into where I'm working at now. Um, and you'll see the connection later on. And uh, but, and then it's just a bit about that. Um, as far as my education, I graduated before 2000 <laughs> from high school. I, I always felt like I need to get out of the old pass and you get out of the small town, got to get out. And I didn't go too far. I went to St. Mary's University for my undergrad. And while I was there, I, I majored in industrial engineering. And while in industrial engineering, I thought, hey, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to go to the private sector, you know, and, and do all that. And I did. And then I was like, well, I'm going to go back to school. And I'm at that time, I was a Bill Gates, um, Melinda Gates scholar. I was one of the first ones to be awarded that scholarship. When I received that, they're like, hey, if you're within these five areas, and one of them was engineering, you will pay for everything. And at that time, I really wasn't thinking, I was like, I'm just gonna get my undergraduate degree and that's it. I'm not thinking about my PhD. I'm not thinking about my master's, anything. I was like, I want to just go to the school and I want to get out and get a job. So I took a year off after I graduated. And then I actually went to University of Mexico to pursue my graduate degree in, mass, uh, in mechanical engineering and Oh man, I'm gonna tell you that after a semester, I was like, yeah, this isn't for me. And I took a industrial statistics course at that time. And that really appealed to me because uh, it was statistics and it was in quality control, you know, all of that Pareto charts, the quality, like the three, six sigma, all that jazz. And I'll, sorry, I'm like, I'm pretty much in layman's terms here. I'm <laughs> not very, uh, I butcher a lot of the words here, but I just felt like maybe engineering is in my path. I'd like to do something with statistics. And I had a really great uh, professor over there in, in University of Mexico. And she's like, yeah, you should try it. And then plus I wanted to move, move back home to San Antonio or to Texas. And I did, and that's how I got to UTSA. And uh, I was at UTSA for around two years. I did the TA ship. Uh, at the time, the statistics program was under the business program, which it still is, and and I managed to graduate there with a graduate degree in 2015. And right, I mean, I'm sorry, 2005, 2015, what am I saying? <laughs> 2005, my apologies. And right now, currently, as Andrew mentioned, I am a, a management program uh, supervisor, but it's really, I'm just the first line supervisor. I, I'm a supervisor of seven data analysts, um, data analysts and st statisticians. So I manage them and I, and I do it all for the Department of Homeland Security or, and within that DHS, it's USCIS, Citizenship, Citizenship and Immigration Services. Cause you know, after 9-11 happened, everything went under DHS and I work for USCIS. All right, oops, there we go. So here's, let's take a look at, I kind of already touched a, a bit about my career pathway here, but um, here you can see it in a nice little diagram or <laughs> a timeline. So while I was at UTSA at that time, 
there was a Texas State admirer, Dr. Murdoch. I'm not sure if you all have heard his name. I think he might still be around, but he was at the, he was visiting at the school of UTSA. And at the time he was going to serve as the director of the US Census Bureau. And while he was at UTSA, he said, hey, he put a call out uh, for all of us to say, hey, if you are interested in interning with the US Census Bureau, you know, let me know, apply and we'll get you set up over there. And I did, I, I went ahead and jumped on that opportunity for one summer. It was a program through the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, HACU. And HACU is a really a great sort of program. They'll set you up with summer internships within the federal government agencies. Uh, I would just Google HACU and they have summer, spring, fall internships. So I went ahead and interned with the US Census Bureau for a summer. And while I was out there at the Census Bureau, which is, uh, I'd say the DC area, so I'll refer to, well, there's Washington DC, but I kind of just call it, we all call it the DMV, like DC, Maryland, and Mar Virginia, because they're all very, DC story in the middle, and then you have Maryland and Virginia, and it's really like, oh man, like a 10 minute drive. <laughs> so while I was there, I, I learned a whole lot. There's a lot of different surveys that the US Census Bureau, you know, that they hold and they carry out. And while I was there, I happened to interview. And while I was there, I interviewed with several different directorates, you know, because, you know, the Census Bureau and label, they conduct the 10, you know, the census. And then they also do a lot of economic based surveys. So I um, interviewed and I, I accepted an offer. And at the time they were giving 20% bonuses of your salary. And then they paid to move everything. So it was a pretty great opportunity. I didn't want to pass up, but I'm going to tell you that I was a little bit nervous because I did not want to leave Texas. I didn't want to leave my family. You know, whole familia is over there. And I didn't know anybody in DC. Um, but fortunately at the time, I had a younger brother that lived in Virginia, not too far away. So I took the job. I, gradu I graduated at UTSA December of 2005. And they allowed me to start in the spring of 2006. And, and I'll tell you, a lot of people that move to the, D, the DC area, they'll say, oh, I'm only going to be there for like three years, tops, and I'm going to go back. I was one of those people, and I've been here for 15 years now. Um, working at the Census Bureau, uh, one of my first jobs, I was a statistician, and I worked on the, the 2010 census. I did a lot of address. We well, basically, I saw a survey from start to finish, meaning create requirements, create a survey, do the data collection, um, set out standards. Um, and then when I say data collection is like making sure, hey, this is the address you need to make, you need to have a variable for the house, the street, state, city, you know, all that information. And the data collection happens. And then I was able to, once we went into production, we were able to receive all of that data and we were able to analyze it. So it was great. And census, we used a lot. And the other thing too, with federal government, you use a lot, we use a lot of SAS. We use a lot of SAS program, um, Unix program. I wasn't really too familiar with it. But that's the sort of work that I did. And the nice thing about census is that I worked on the decennial side of things and then there's and as I mentioned there's several areas among census where you can go work in other places and after that I so in 2012 I went ahead and worked on CPS which is the current population survey and then CPS I did a lot of the sampling there so it was a great experience and at Census Bureau you work with Pretty much everywhere ready there is a statistician. You have applied statisticians. You have the theoretical sort of, um, I want to say guys, but the, you know, and women, but the theoretical type of statisticians where they come up with sampling design, um, figure out the estimate estimates, and then you have those that 
do the applied work. And I will tell you, and then you even have people work on survey designs. And so I enjoyed my time at the Census Bureau, but I, the thing is with the federal government, you kind of just, you don't really receive a high end like compensation as compared to when you work for the private sector. And in the federal government, you know, the, the opportunities to advance or to move up or salary wise, um, it could be a little bit slow, slower. And for me, my own personal, I guess, pathway is just like, I enjoyed it, but you know, it wasn't my jam. I wanted to do something else. Like I wanted to do more applied work. I wanted to be able to work with data that I guess I had a personal connection with and that I would find interesting. So living in the DC area, you have a lot of federal agencies and a lot of them, we all, you know, they all collect data. And uh, we, all, we all use data, you know, for policymaking, decision-making, rules and laws. And, you know, this is where, it's where everything sort of happens. All the headquarters, well, most of the agencies headquarters are all based in the DC area. And there's a lot of opportunities. So around 2013, I saw a job posting for USCIS. USCIS. And um, I was like, hey, that's, you know what? My parents were immigrants. I, uh, I had a personal connection to that. And two, I wanted to learn more about immigration in the United States. And well, I don't know if you watch the news, but it's a pretty hot topic and it has been for the past five or six years. And uh, so I wanted to learn more about that. And then I wanted to understand more about how did my dad come over here? And how did my mom become a uh, I'd say LPR, but green card holder, LPR is legal permanent resident. And uh, I wanted to be able to understand like, how do other people immigrate to this country? So there was a job posting for a statistician with USCIS. So I, uh, I applied, I was able to interview and I got the job. And, uh, and that's why and I'm there today. So when I started working at USCIS, I started working in the policy shop. This is where all the rules and regulations, immigration law changes like every year. Something happens, it's just like DACA, right? We were accepting, well, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with DACA, but we were accepting initial applications and then, oh man, Texas, you know, there's an injunction and we couldn't, <laughs> I'll just say Texas because of the judge, right? But we couldn't, uh, we couldn't, uh, we had to stop accepting these applications or process them. So I worked in the policy shop where we collected all of this data. And the reason we collect, and the reason behind how we collect all this data, it's, it's based on all these applications. You wanna naturalize, you fill out an application. All that information is collected and we have access to it and we, we run the numbers. And at the time, USCIS was, hey, in order for us to create new policies, create new regulations, we need to make data-driven decisions. We can't just say, hey, we got to do this. But it's like, hey, you need to be able to sh show the data to be, you know, have that data to be able to show, yeah, this will work or this is what we need to do to back up these decisions. So it was pretty. It was interesting. Um, it was very different than working in the Census Bureau, just because within USCIS, it is very close, like whatever happens in the White House, it directly impacts us. So any rules and regulations, any new administrations, when I say city, any new presidency that comes in, they have their own, they have their own agenda. And uh, whatever you are working on one year, it's going to change the next year. New president, new way of thinking, new rules, and anything you worked on, it changes. So anything that happens in the White House or Congress, it directly impacted us. And we also work with a lot of politicals. When I say politicals, it's like Capitol Hill, congressmen, senators. So I would say I did a year and a half in policy. So now I'm in the data reporting shop. 
and I started off as a statistician. And I'll tell you the data here, it wasn't, not everything's a normal distribution, you know, on the textbooks, everything happens to be a normal <laughs> bell curve and it's great. Well, out here it's like, nope, <laughs> it's not. Um, and the data too is not pretty, it's not clean. There's lots of duplicates, um, a lot of missing, a lot of missing data, data entry errors. So, and all, and the data is like in three or four or five different databases and they're all not the same. They're all not named the same, it's not standard. So it's like, wow, we're a data collection agency, but we're not a statistical one. So these systems were just built to collect data so we can collect funds. The thing about DHS also, or immigration and citizenship, USCIS is that we're fee funded. So if uh, the government shuts down, we still keep working. Because 98% of the money that we bring in are from the funds from these applications. Um, so in, well, I skipped around, but in 2018, I happened, well, the opportunity arose like, hey, Greasy, we, you know, we got a great team here. We need some leadership. We need some management. Would you like to be a supervisor? And I was like, not really, man. I like to work with the data. I like to, you know, do all this. But at that point in time, I was kind of like, well, you know what? I'd rather, I don't want anybody new to be telling me what to do. <laughs> I'd rather just, I'll, you know, oh, sure. Like, I, I'll try it. And it's been great. I, I will tell you that it's been great. Um, I have a team of seven analysts and they're all pretty awesome. And uh, what my team does is any sort of data requests that come in. So that's what I mentioned, like we do a lot of applied work. So it's just really a lot of da data manipulation um, of this, you know, sometimes not clean data to be able to provide requesters with their reports. Like Congress or certain senators are always asking how many H-1Bs live in my congressional district. When I say H-1Bs, these are the high skilled visa, uh, visa workers, you know, individuals that come into the states and they work for Silicon Valley. Um, or they want to know how many people are eligible to naturalize and they haven't yet. Because, you know, if you're a green card holder or an LPR for five years, you're, well, three, if you're married and five, if, you know, um, you become eligible to naturalize after five years because people want to know that because it's important, you know, it's important to naturalize or, you know, you want to be able to vote. <laughs> um, the other thing, you know, we get several sort of requests and we even get requests from the White House. Um, some of our analysts, when they work with this data, um, have gotten uh, deposed. Like USCIS, we get sued a lot um, in the sense that people are like, you're taking way too long to process my application. Like, why is it? Is there some sort of bias here? And we've had analysts have to pull this data, come up with reports and see like, if, if, a, certain, if a person is from a certain country, are they being processed a longer time? And why is it? And some of our analysts have been deposed, like have had to uh, sit in a deposition with the Department of Justice. So that's the other thing, like the data that you're working with, these are people's lives. Um, like even my dad's information, like it's in there somewhere. I mean, I can't look it up because I want to, because, you know, I have to, I sign like souls confidentiality and I'm, you know, I'm a protector of the data. But that is sort of the sense why I joined USCIS. And uh, I like its mission. We grant immigrants benefits, and then we grant non-immigrants the ability to come over to our country to work. And, uh, and that's the mission that I, you know, that's what keeps me driving. That's what drives me. And I want, and I like, and I, I'd say I'm a public servant in that sense. And that, wet work is meaningful and rewarding for me. All right. Oh, all right, that's the end of my timeline. Oops. All right. So what do I, what was my day-to-day -day work? 
and you'll see here as a picture of my group. Well, half of my group, there's two groups here. My group, we focus on naturalization data, um, humanitarian sort of petitions, um, in the sense that people that are victims of trafficking, you know, that they come in from another country, well, they bring them over. And I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but like there's women that they bring over as nannies and then, well, and they mistreat them, they abuse them. Well, that person, they're in the United States, they're able to apply for a visa because they're a victim of trafficking or a crime. So my, my group, we work on humanitarian based petitions. The other thing that my group works on, we work on calculating processing times and we update that on the website. Like how long is your application taking? That's something that we work on as well. Um, the other, we do a lot of the DACA reporting, the Deferred Action of Childhood Arrivals, or I think uh, the Dreamers. And uh, so we release a lot of reports. We release a lot of fact sheets about these different populations because there's a lot of groups, a lot of uh, lawyers that use our data. And as, as far as I work right now, like I've been working from home, I'd say since well, the pandemic and I don't see myself going back into the office until January, 2022, but we're all allowed to remotely work from home uh, or telework. And we don't really have to go into the office like one or two days. And being a supervisor, I'm in a lot of meetings. I'm not gonna lie. There's always a meeting every day. I touch base with my staff. I, I well, when I can, I try to answer a lot of questions. <laughs> what I do is, I try to negotiate timelines because as I said, we get a lot of reports that come in and we have, and sometimes they're like, well, we need it today. And it's kind of like, Hey man, I only got like six people to work here with and they're all busy. Like we're all busy. And uh, so we try to sort of negotiate timelines of, you know, delivering those reports. What I'll also do is I'll serve a ment as a mentor or I'll review these reports when, um, and I, when I see reports, it's just sort of like work, sometimes they're workload based, like how many receipts, how many applications have we received over naturalizations? Or another sort of report that we do is like, who's taking the longest to naturalize? Like, is it, you know, people from Mexico versus people from India? Like who's taking the longest and why is it? You know, that's so, some of the, the workload that we work on as well. Um, the other thing too is networking. Um, try to create partnerships with people within headquarters and then people within the field. And when I say field, it's the people that actually do the adjudicating, the officers, the immigration officers that do conduct the interviews. Like, I don't know if anybody or any of you seen 90 Day Fiance, the K-1 visa. That's, an, <laughs> that's another, you know, set of petitions and data that we see. And people that interview them those what we call the officers, the adjudicators. And they're the ones that know their ins and outs of immigration law. I don't, but I just, you know, I learned about it. I learned about it, I learned about the process at a very high level. So it's sort of networking. And the other thing too is managing workload of my staff. Because being in a job or a workplace, you wanna keep, you wanna maintain a work-life balance and you wanna make sure that your staff knows that. So, cause if they're good, you don't want them to leave. <laughs> cause then you have to find somebody else and you're like, ah, oh. you know, you don't want to, the turnover rates, you want to keep it low. But the thing is too, it's like, you want to work and it just depends on what your values are, right? Like you want to have a good boss, you want to have a great relationship and you want to be able to have a good work-life balance. And the other things is trainings. I, I try to learn about anything new that's out there and then maybe something to share with my staff. But to tell you the truth, sometimes you don't really have the time because I deal with a lot of the, uh, I guess as manager stuff, just, you know, paperwork and timesheets and sometimes with the staff. But that's sort of, uh, in a nutshell, is the sort of thing they do, all right. And here you go, here's my list. I actually uh, asked my colleagues to give me, hey you guys, can you give me like 
pros and cons list of being a federal government employee. Because some of the staff, some of my colleagues have been, have worked in the private sector for a while. So I'd say like one of the pros is job security. <laughs> Outside random furloughs. And when I say furloughs, it's just sort of like, hey, you're going to be out of money. We're going to have to shut down until, you know, we get funding and or a government shutdown. Um, but as I mentioned, DHS or USCIS, we're fee funded. So whenever the government shuts down, we still keep on going because we have our own funding. Um, the other pro here is, well, employee-based uh, flexibilities. You're allowed to telework. We now, because of COVID, we've all been working from home and, and successfully, I would think, because before it was kind of like, if you're not in the office, you're not working sort of mentality. But now like with COVID, that all changed. So now we have the ability to hire people remotely, meaning like recently, like I, we hired somebody that lives in Colorado in Nebraska. They're working in our office, they're essentially virtual, but they're working for us, you know, the, you know we're all working at headquarters. Um, the other thing is great benefits. You have great health benefits. Like you have, oh my gosh, I think you're able to select like out of 30 different, you have 30, like over 30 or 50 choices of health insurances. And I'm gonna tell you that it's really important or I mean, it, it's a great perk to have great retirement and life insurance as well. The other thing too is annual and sick leave. As a government employee, you gain or you earn in your first three years, no wait. Yeah, I think believe in your first three years, you earn two to four hours of annual leave per pay period. So you get paid every two weeks. And every of those pay periods, you get four hours of annual leave. And then you also get sick leave. So you have two banks, annual that you can use for anything and then sick leave for when you know where you're sick or you need to take a mental health day, no matter. And the other thing that was great and it just took so long to pass and I missed the cutoff is that the government now offers paid parental leave because before you would have to use your sick leave and annual leave. But now if you have to take parental leave, you, you can take it for three three months and it's paid and you don't use your leave or your, your, your annual leave or sick leave. And the other thing is mission driven. Like with any of the agencies that you work for, we all, ha we all have a mission and, and you know what you're working towards too. And it's also great to be a public servant. And one thing too, and one of my buddies mentioned this because he used to work for Chase Bank, which is a high well, high profile and very pressure, a lot of pressure, he told me. A little very stressed out guy. But he mentioned that one of the pros for working federal government is that it's less competition and less pressure than in the private sector. And that's, that's it. You don't really have to compete, you know, with employees or with other employees or colleagues. And uh, there's sort of like less pressure in the sense that you know, you only really in the government, you're working like 40 hours a week. You're not really, aren't, you're not really working more than that. <laughs> Cause if you do, then you're, you're granted, uh, comp, you know, credit hours or overtime. So it's, it's not a bad gig. And the other thing too, being a federal government and depending on the agency as well, um, it allows you the ability to have some sort of health, you know, maintain a healthy work-life balance. So that's just, you know, some of the cons and I mean pros, sorry, not cons, but some of the cons here, um, it, depending on the agency or the office or the manager, it can be very rigid, meaning that there's lots of rules. There's a lot of red tape. So if you wanna try something new or you wanna buy a new software, it's a lot of the times it'll be like, no. I'm sorry, you can't do it. Um, the other thing is advancement could be slower than in the private sector. Meaning, you know, getting promotions, moving up higher and compensation as well. The other thing, less modern technology, um, less compensation when compared to a private sector job. 
less perks. Well, one of my, uh, we have, we have contractors that work for us. So they're in a sense, private sector. When it's less, they said, well, this is one of her cons is that there's less perks than in the private sector. You know, the ability to have more bonuses and, or free food. <laughs> um, the one thing now within the federal government, we have job postings or job series. And one of them, you know, we have statisticians. We, well, we have mathematical statisticians. We have survey statisticians. Uh, we have operations, re uh, operations research analysts or we also have management and program analysts. But right now we don't have a job series for data analysts. I mean, that's all new. I feel like data and now analysts or like our analytics, that's sort of like, I'd probably say like within a few years, it's like such a new thing that, you know, everybody's all about it, but the government, we haven't caught up yet. We're getting there, but not yet. Um, the other thing too is projects can take a long time to implement. Um, when I worked at the Census Bureau, people were like, does it really take 10 years to get ready for a census? And I'd be like, yes, it really does. <laughs> Trust me, with the stuff the way it goes, it's like, yeah, it really does. And the other thing, as I mentioned too, is like priorities can shift depending on administration. And that just really depends on the agency that you're working with. You could be working on stuff for like two years and then boom, new president. And it's like, you know, whatever you did then, we're gonna have to shift and go back to the other thing. And you're like, what? I spent so much time, but hey, it happens. So there's some of the cons to sort of consider um, with being a Fed. The other thing too, I guess I would say is that a lot of these federal jobs for statisticians, you know, I'd say the bulk or the majority of them are located in the DC area. And I, I think it's, well, I don't know. I, for me, it was just sort of like a hard sell. Like, oh man, I mean, it was tough. It was tough to be, to leave, I think, because the whole family was at home. But hey, if you're open to it, I go for it, you know? All right. So I think this is probably one of my last slides is, well, Andrea asked me like, hey, maybe you can give us some advice. <laughs> and I'm like, sure. So here I have some like quick tips. Um, the one I will tell you is don't be afraid to sign, uh, to apply or, or sign up for an internship. Paid, if it's, it's better. But if it's unpaid, well, hey, it's better than nothing. That job experience, having that work experience is super helpful. Now, if you're interested in working, you know, or get your feet wet working for the federal government, you can go to usajobs.gov and I would, I would search in the job search for pathways. That's the internship program. So you can get hired as an internship and you can, I mean, I'm sorry, as an intern and you can work as an intern, well, for however long the, the office will have you with the hope of making you permanent. The nice thing about this is that while you're doing that, you're earning tenure. So remember that leave, I was talking about like once you get your 15 years, you get eight hours of leave. So that means you get two days of vacation days every month. It's pretty great. And you never lose it. Like you just accumulate it. Um, so that's just one way. And I will mention, um, that my office particularly, we will be posting a remote intern position within USCIS and it'll be through the Pathways program. Just plug, plug. And the other thing too is I, I am sending job opportunities or intern opportunities to Dr. Keating and hopefully he's sharing them, <laughs> I don't know. But as far as the internship, private, private sector as well, go for it. The other thing too, I don't know if UTSA has it, because um, we've had some interns come into the office and I'm like, well, don't you have a career center? <laughs> if you do have a career center, I would um, hit it up for resume writing help um, and mock interviews. Definitely practice interviewing because I've sat in on several hiring panels and oh man, I can tell you what doesn't work. I've, I'm kind of like, man, where did you... Like preparation is key. Um, you know, like research, 
who you're interviewing with. Try it, you know, try to go in there prepared knowing something about the company or, you know, or the agency. Um, always ask questions, um, always be prepared. But it's very helpful because I've been, I've sat in some panels and they were a little, little bit of a doozies and I'm like, okay. I've had people come in and sit in interviews and be like, well, why did you apply for this job? And then the first thing they tell me is, well, I just want a promotion. And it's like, oh man, come on. We all want a promotion, but you just kind of say, I want to be able to advance <laughs> my current skills. Say it in other ways, but anyway, yes, mock interviews, great. I mean, I'm just saying great advice. The other thing too is networking. I'll tell you from my own experience, when I was in school, I was like, man, I don't want to do any of this schmoozing, small talk business because it wasn't me. But I tell you, uh, getting out, well, not getting out, but, you know, just after graduating and then working, uh, meeting people, it's, it's good. It's good to meet people. It's also good to make connections. Um, and it's always good. The other thing, too, like, don't be afraid to ask questions or don't be afraid to ask for help. The other thing I will say is if you have any communications class or business writing course, I would definitely recommend doing that because um, I, I, I guess being with an engineering and stats, I really didn't have to take many English courses <laughs> at all, uh, writing courses. So some of my writing has been a sort of a struggle. And that's the other thing too, like we're always looking for statisticians. We're always looking for analysts. But the other thing that's very important is, hey, can you write? Can you express something that's difficult to, for somebody that's not a, not, not a math person or not a stats person? Are you able to explain it in plain language? Help describe a concept to them that they will not understand. Because in my job, we work with a lot of lawyers. And these lawyers, they don't know anything about numbers. They don't know what a median is. So you need to be able to explain that to them. Um, the other thing too, be flexible. You know, to the sense that if you want, uh, take any opportunities. If it takes you outside of Texas, I'd say go for it. I mean, if you're able to, if you're comfortable. But yeah, I'd be flexible about it. And sort of patient in the sense when applying for government jobs because it's a hit or miss sometimes. You can submit applications and it may take years to even get in the system. Um, the other thing too is learn other languages. Um, the, I will tell you the federal government, we have a huge contract with SAS. Sorry, she just fell asleep. And that's the main sort of software that we use. But right now, a lot of the staff, they're using R they're uh, just SQL, any sort of SQL coding or Spark SQL because you're able to use other software. Like another thing right now that a lot of the, the guys on my team, they use Databricks and it's just a lot of Spark SQL coding. Um, the other thing people are using are Tableau, just sort of as a data visualization sort of tool. Um, Python, just try to be open to learning other languages or programming languages. The other thing too is being able to present your findings or do using different softwares or even using Excel to for data visualization because people love their graphics. Your manager or your manager or whoever you're presenting to, they love graphs. No pie charts, those are not good. But anyway, they love bar graphs, they love histograms. They like all that stuff. And as I mentioned, yeah, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, now, the other thing too is just sort of network, um, you know, with your professors. And, and I think it's also great. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that I, I'm here to be able to share with y'all like my experiences within the federal government and, uh, and be able to share this with you. And if you all have any, well, I think that's my last slide. Oh, yeah, if you all have any questions, I have my personal email there because I know it could be a little intimidating to ask somebody, well, I guess, you know, in front of everybody else, but I'd say I'm 
I'm happy to help in any way that I can. I, I know that it can be a little bit, well, I don't know. For me, it was a little scary and daunting the whole world of like navigating, you know, finding a job after school or trying to figure out what do I want to do in my future. Um, but yeah, and the thing is I've made several sort of, I don't say several sort of connections, but I do know people at the Census Bureau that are always looking to hire people. Um, I do know people within USAS and I do know others that work in other parts of the agency. Um, and I, oh, and I totally meant to mention this, but all of the views and opinions <laughs> that I've shared here are of my own and not of DHS or USCIS. But then I'll open the floor uh, for any questions or um, if anybody has any questions, feel free. I, but yeah, that's pretty much the gist of what I got going on over here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, we encourage everyone to turn on their camera and ask questions. Uh, Nicholas has one, if you want to unmute yourself. Sorry, my camera set up. Hey, thank you uh, for the presentation um, and for joining with us. I was just wondering, um, how many different administrations did you work for? Uh, two or? Oh, well, within... Oh man, so so when I worked at the Census Bureau, we didn't really have many politicals. Um, when I say politicals, like the work that we did, we really didn't have much impact from the administration. Once I worked with USCIS, I was there during the Obama administration for two years, and then the Trump administration, and that was fun. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, like, uh, which administration did you feel like you were able to get more work done? Hmm. Well, <laughs> it's not a political question, just a, a, a fact, right? <laughs> well, we, well, the thing is we did, a, we did, a, I'm sorry, hold on. Gotta move my seat here. Oh man, she fell asleep on me. <laughs> I'd say, sorry about that. No, we, we did a lot of work. Um, it just sort of, Within, within each administration, we did have to carry a lot of work. Uh, we did a, a whole lot, a lot of it. It wasn't necessarily like a, and where I am at now, we just do sort of reporting of what they want, like what their priorities are that dictated our job. So we got that done. We didn't work, I would say like in the policy area, like I know one of the main things, and like I'll just give an example. Like I know that Obama introduced DACA right? He had mm -hmm. that executive order. And there's this whole push. And even right now during the Biden administration, there was that push and to accept more, process more of these initial applications, and then hopefully, hopefully find a pathway for them to become legal permanent residents or adjust. Uh, when I say adjust, is to become a legal permanent resident or to become a green card holder. And then after that, that's a pathway to naturalization. And I see somebody ask that question, what does it mean to naturalize? It's to become a US citizen. Um, so I know that during Obama, that happened, he had the executive order. And then during the Trump administration, there was another executive order, which sort of just put the kibosh on all that, right? And then right now with the Biden administration, once he started, we were able to start processing initial applications. And then the injunction, when I say Texas, was one of the Texas judges over there, he filed an injunction. And because of that, it put us, it stalled that. So at the time, we're only able to process renewal applications. So if you already granted DACA, and, and I believe DACA only lasts for three years, um, then you're able to reapply and we'll process those applications. As far as a pathway to adjust, I'm assuming that's still being worked on and we'll see what happens. I was wondering, uh, do you think it, so it was one of the, it was one of the cons I think, right? That, um, that you had to sh like shift your priorities depending on the administration. Do you think it, you're, you'd be able to perform your job better if you were, if you were independent from the administration in a sense? Yeah, I think so. Like there is another, and that's a great question because, um, and that brings me to a point because I know 
people that work at the Government Accountability Office, GAO, and they're nonpartisan. So what they do, and they have analysts over there as well, because there's data everywhere, right? And this data needs to be analyzed. Um, what they do is, they're, I don't wanna say like investigate, but they'll come to different agencies and learn the processes and expose, you know, hey, you could be doing things better here. Or what's going on here? They're, it's, they're sort of like a government, let's say, not say QA checker, but you know, sort of like a check, hey, are you doing things the way you're supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. I think they get a lot of work done. Here, yeah, like with, sometimes it's just like, it's frustrating. It's frustrating as an employee when you've worked so long and so much like the office, within USCIS, we have an office of citizenship, citizenship. And in that office, they have people that design the the tests the civics test and the english test right and they've worked like i'd say that maybe they would work like two years on perfecting this test and then you and mr comes in they're like nah <laughs> make this test a little bit harder oh man but i'm not gonna say but hey these are my opinions but this is what i hear you know so yeah it's i think that you can get a lot of work done um and i think that you won't have that level of frustration, but that's the way it is with it. Then it just really depends on the, in the agency that you're working for. Got it. I, I just have one more question <laughs> after this. I'm, I'm a green card holder. Okay. Uh, and I guess I'm an, I'm technically, I'm, I'm, a, I'm eligible to be naturalized is what you said. So I've been eligible. a uh -huh. green card holder, holder for over five years. Yeah. But I don't have any desire to get my citizenship. Um, but I can't, I can't work for the government then, right? As an LPR, you should be able to, I think. Yeah. Even, even without citizenship? I think so. I think if you're an LPR, you have to look at the requirements and eligibility. Okay. I, I think it deep. Well, you know what, actually, I don't, I'll have to look at the <laughs> requirements okay. and eligibility, actually. Um, just to make sure, because I know that, or if not, there's contractors, because I know that no, I think you, you know, have to see. Maybe in certain agencies you can, and then I don't know. Yeah, you can work, work for the government because I worked for the government as an asylee before I even had the a green card. So yeah. I think you can depends on the on the I guess agency or the the part of the government work working for. Yeah, but you can. Interesting. Yeah. I just thought it was like a no. <laughs> I think that I, well, it's, I'm not sure. I forgot. I'm sorry. I didn't catch your name where I was talking, but I think it just really depends. Like if you're wanting to work for the FBI or the right, um, yeah. or yeah. CIA, you would have to be a, U a, a USC, a US citizen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, uh, but I always look at the requirements and eligibility because I know that I've met some contractors and they were green, there were LPRs. Mm -hmm and working within USCIS. But okay. it, it, because in some agencies, you're required to have a top secret clearance because mm -hmm. you're working with really sensitive data. And that you do have to be a USC. Right. Um, and like at the Census Bureau, we only had like a public trust because a lot of the data was already anonymized. And it's not, you know, it's just, you know, reporting population stats. May I ask why you have no desire to naturalize? Um, I guess my my plan is, um, I, although I do enjoy living over here now, is uh, to move overseas at some point, either Southeast Asia or somewhere in Europe. Yep. Um, and that's where I guess data science is kind of an interesting career path because um, these burgeoning places have lots of different, I guess, opportunities when it comes to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I guess I don't see an urgency uh, to get it because my green card is still valid and I can renew it. I, I'm, a, I'm assuming I can renew it. Uh, but then if I, if I reach a point where I, I can't renew it, then that's where I guess I'll have to make the, the decision. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I get it. That's because I, I only ask because uh, at my, uh, 
the job right now, I, we're a part of working groups because uh, President Biden issued an executive order where he wants to encourage those that are eligible to naturalize to do it, mm. to naturalize. Yeah, I figured I'm, I'm in that group, I'm in the demographic. <laughs> and I'm in these calls because my father has not naturalized. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and people are always asking why. And I'm kind of like, well, I can share it with you, but I'm like, uh. And they're like, well, no, it really can't be because of that. I'm like, okay, well, never mind then. <laughs> But no, it's yeah, just like I said, there's no I guess there's no sense of urgency if there was some sort of like um I guess something got something in the mail or you know and saying like you know you need to decide, you know, by X amount of days or something like that, then that's where I guess I would sit down and think really think about it. But for now it doesn't really affect my life choices or or my future yeah. choices, I guess. So yeah. yeah. Thank you for answering my question. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Really quick, Koi. Um, I know we're almost at time. Gracie, I don't know what your um, timeline looks like. I don't want to keep you here if you have something going on. I will stop the recording. Uh, and if you're willing to stick around for any more questions, we can do that. I'll stick around if anyone has any Stats Club related questions as well. But thank you officially for coming. And it's been really great um, just hearing about all the work you do. I do have a couple of questions, but I'm holding. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's great. After.